Good evening, Cape Town. Thank you for staying awake. Let's see if we can change that. <coughs> and um, thank you for the very kind introduction. Some of it's even true. I am, I am, for example, a mathematical physicist. And this means that I spend a lot of my time thinking about shapes. Everything from the shape of a spider web to the vortex that forms in your bathtub as the water drains. I think about that a lot. <laughs> to the shapes underlying the fundamental structures of space and time. I'm kind of obsessed with patterns. And this might be why, for a long time, my favorite show on TV was House. Where's Taran in the audience? Before that, it was Buffy. And House is a show where, once you strip away the bells and whistles of Hollywood, is really a show about pattern recognition in the form of medical diagnostics. I mean, this is how it works, right? You have a sniffly nose, a sore throat. You go to the doctor, and they tell you it's a cold, except when it's not. And this is the thing about medical diagnostics that makes it so much more difficult than some of the easy things that I normally find myself thinking about, like black holes and quantum space-time. <laughs> is the human element. Every patient is unique. Every patient comes to you with a unique medical history. And this throws a whole bunch of new variables into the problem that makes things really, really difficult to try and model, especially if you're a mathematical physicist or a mathematician like I am. And you try to model everything mathematically. So real life is complicated. And as an example, let's think about cancer. Breast cancer is the single most prevalent form of cancer afflicting women across the demographic spectrum. In 2012 alone, there were 1.7 million new cases of breast cancer diagnosed. And this represents about 12% of all cancers reported in that year alone, and resulted in about a half a million deaths. So clearly, understanding, properly diagnosing, and effectively treating the tumor is critical to patient care. And much of this boils down to knowing precisely which form of cancer you're dealing with. In other words, it becomes a classification problem, and a difficult classification problem at that. To give you some perspective on how, this, how difficult this is, think about it this way. To completely understand a given tumor requires you to know the level of expression of each of about 24,000 genes in a particular sample at the genetic level. So if I had to phrase this mathematically, this tells me that every tumor can be represented as a point in a 24,000-dimensional parameter space. That's huge. And if, like me, you spend a lot of your time searching for the keys you've lost, you know how difficult it is to place a point in a measly three-dimensional space, where I only have to give you three pieces of information <laughs> to tell you where you've lost your keys. In 2011, three scientists, Monica Nicolaou, Gunnar Carlson, and Arnold Levine, studied a data set of about 295 breast cancer tumors. And each tumor corresponded to a unique patient, and each tumor could be represented as a point in a 24,000-odd dimensional space parameter space. And what they found was remarkable. In and amongst a set of really aggressive tumors, known as estrogen receptor positive tumors, was a subset in which the patients displayed a 100% survival rate with little to no intervention and no metastasis. And what this represented, this new tumor that they called CMYB positive, what this represented was a rare, benign island in a sea of aggressive tumors. It's a remarkable thing, gone completely unnoticed before that. But here's a real kicker. Carlson 
Nicolau and Levine are not oncologists. In fact, they're not medical doctors at all. What they are, are applied mathematicians. And so you'd wonder, how does a group of mathematicians get together and diagnose a completely new form of cancer? And the answer, it turns out, is in how they analyze the data. You see, traditional methods of analyzing data requires you to focusing on localized clusters of the data. What Carlson and company did was they took a step back and they looked at the shape of the data in data space. And what they found was this characteristic Y-shaped structure. And down one arm of this Y-shaped structure was precisely the cancer tumors that had gone completely unnoticed. Why? Because everybody, in using traditional methods, focused up here. But when you take the shape into account, you see completely new information emerge. And crucial to their analysis was an arcane branch of mathematics known as topology, the study of shapes. There's an old joke that a topologist is a mathematician that doesn't distinguish between their coffee cup and their donut. That's because as far as topology is concerned, they're one and the same thing. That's because I can think of the two as being made up of some pliable rubber, and I can continuously morph the one into the other like you're seeing without doing anything drastic to either shape, like cutting, tearing, puncturing, just reshaping, twisting, deforming. So the essential shape of both of these things are the same. And what mathematics does, what topology does in particular, is it assigns a number, a discrete number, an integer, like 0, 1, 2, etc., to each shape that completely characterizes its, the essence of its shape. So that if I want to compare two things, one of these cubes, for example, to a soccer ball, all I need to do is compare their numbers. I don't need to know English or Afrikaans or Kosa. I don't need to be able to describe it. I just give you the number. It's objective. And I can tell you whether these two things are the same or not. So let's think about the cube, one of these cubes. It's a simple enough object. It has faces. And the faces come together, two faces come together on an edge, and three edges come together on a vertex. So it has faces, edges, and vertices. In fact, a cube has six faces, eight vertices, and 12 edges. And in fact, the number that we're working with, the number that I'm looking to describe to you, the number that characterizes the shape of this thing, the essence of its shape, I get by taking the number of vertices, subtracting off the number of edges, and adding the number of faces. 8 minus 12 plus 6, 2. This thing is a blue 2. <laughs> and one way to test whether this actually captures the essence of this is by taking this blue 2 and deforming it. So imagine I take a cube, and I take its top four vertices and its bottom four vertices, and I bring them together to a single point. I'll get another shape, and that shape looks like this. My claim is they're the same, and I can prove that, because this is nothing but a multicolored tube. It's an octahedron, and as an octahedron, it has six vertices, you can count them, 12 edges, and eight faces. Again, six minus 12 plus eight is two. And it turns out that this combination of vertices minus edges plus faces is exactly one such topological number. It doesn't change when I deform this object. It captures the essence of its shape. It's called the Euler number after the 18th century polymath, Leonard Euler. So what about that soccer ball? Well, if you're a mathematician, you think of a soccer ball as a truncated icosahedron. That means you can take one of these guys and you can build them up by taking a bunch of black pentagons and sewing them together with white hexagons and gluing the whole bunch together on vertices. 60 vertices to be precise, 90 edges, and 32 faces. Again, it's a two. <laughs> so it turns out that the soccer ball is identical to one of these cubes. And you thought soccer wasn't an intellectual sport. Very good. And just in case you get the mistaken 
impression that everything's a two. If I take one of these soccer balls and I puncture a hole through it, I'll get a shape like this. This is called a toroidal polyhedron. And it has 24 vertices, 24 faces, and 48 edges, and it's a zero. And in fact, anything that's vaguely donut-like is also a zero. And this is the remarkable thing about topology, is that it simply doesn't care about anything local, any local deformations, twistings, reshapings that you might do to an object. It gives you global, holistic information. And by assigning a number, a discrete number, a, an integer, to one of these shapes, you're able to distill simplicity from complexity. So here's an idea worth spreading, I think. What if we took these topological methods and we applied it to the idea of information itself? You know, in today's world, immersed as we are in smartphones and social media and the internet, we're kind of used to thinking that we live in an age of information. But how many of you have ever stopped and thought about what is information? What is it, really? Well, a technical, rigorous definition is much too obvious for this time of the night. So I won't attempt to give you one. But what I will attempt to do is give you some intuition for what it is. So let's imagine the following. Suppose I gave you a test as you were leaving the venue, and I recorded your score. And it was a test to measure how much topology you learned in this talk. Don't look so worried. I'm, it's a hypothetical. <laughs> Maybe. You see, each test score is a data point. It's a raw, unprocessed fact. Information is what I get when I take that raw, unprocessed fact, and I organize it, and I develop it, and I process it. That's the difference between data and information. So for example, if I looked at, I don't know, row five, let's say, <clears throat> and I wanted to use their test scores to analyze the performance of row five. Experience dictates that those test scores would range between the one or two people that didn't get any of my questions correct to my wife, who's always correct. <laughs> Everybody else would fall somewhere in between. And so if I plot a bar chart of what was going on, it would look something like this. And if I asked my five-year-old son to draw the shape of this bar chart, I'd probably get something like this. Well, I, that's not entirely true. Anybody that knows my kids that knows that if I ask my five-year-old to draw any picture, it looks like this. <laughs> but this bell-shaped curve is actually quite important. It's what statisticians call a normal distribution. And for a lot of questions, it actually captures all the information of that bar chart, working out the average score in that particular row. How many people got that average score? What is the distribution of scores around that average? All of that is captured in this curve. The bar chart's just a scaffold. I can get rid of it once I've built the building. So if I wanted to compare row five to row three, for example, all I need to do is compare their normal distributions. And for the most part, that captures all the information. But how do I make this more precise? Because I'm a mathematician. So it's not enough to just draw two curves on the piece of paper. I'd like to give you an objective way of capturing that information. Well, what you need to do is you need to go to the space of all possible such curves. It would look like this. This is what we call a hyperbolic space, a hyperbolic plane, to be more precise. And if you've seen this picture before, this is kind of nostalgic for you, it might be because you've seen something like this. This is Escher's drawings of angels and demons. So the hyperbolic plane is featured regularly in artwork. And every point on this hyperbolic plane is one such curve. So here's our red curve, and here's our black curve, for example. If I want to know how different those two curves are, I need to tell you how far apart they are in the space. And for that, I need a ruler. Why? Because as you all fondly, I'm sure, remember from high school mathematics, that was a joke, nobody ever remembers high school mathematics fondly. <laughs> Not even the high school students in the audience. Um, 
geometry is about angles and shapes. So what this ruler, what statisticians again call the Fisher information metric, because this space tells us about information, what the Fisher metric allows us to do is it allows us to explore the geometry of this space. At my laboratory for quantum gravity and strings at the University of Cape Town, we spend a lot of our time scratching our heads thinking about shapes. In particular, we would like to push this idea even further. We would like to ask, what is the shape? What is the essential shape? What is the topology of information space? And you might well ask, why would you possibly want to do that? The answer is, it keeps me off the streets. <laughs> there are actually many answers. But here's one that I find particularly fascinating. The human brain. Arguably, the most complex entity in the known universe. And I use the word complex here in a technical sense. The most complex entity in the known universe. It single-handedly controls most of your bodily functions. It's physiology, electrochemistry, and even its genetic processes from before you're born until the moment you die. Through the collective, complex firing of billions of neurons in our brains, we're able to hear from within the womb, even. Within moments of birth, we're able to process visual stimuli. Within one year, the average human baby is able to outdo the best robot that mankind has ever built. The human brain is a learning machine like no other in the universe. And I would like to understand how the human brain works. And there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that the way the human brain works is not like a computer, not like a digital computer that we're familiar with, predicated on the ones and zeros of circuits. It behaves in a non-local way. It behaves like a quantum computer. So in order to understand how the human brain works, it seems I need to understand how information works at the level of the molecules and atoms that make up each and every one of us. I need to understand quantum information. And topology, the ability to assign numbers to things, discrete numbers, and extract simplicity from complexity, is an invaluable tool in understanding how quantum information works. Someone once said that in as much as the 20th century was the golden era of physics that gave us quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of general relativity, the standard models of particle physics and cosmology, and showed us our place in the universe, that the 21st century will be the era of biology. I disagree. I think what we're seeing more and more are diverse subjects like you saw there. Physics, mathematics, computer science, data science, neuroscience, medicine, come together in ways we've never imagined before with a single common thread, information. I think what we're seeing is the dawn of the era of information. And I, for one, cannot wait to see the shape of things to come. Thank you.